Oh man, Cicero Christian Church, it's so good to be with you this morning. It is so good to come and share. Um, a, a bit about myself first and foremost. Kim introduced me a bit, uh, but I'm Josh Tandy. I'm the campus pastor at AU. I got a picture of my family here uh, uh, that's on the screen. If you're a little slow on the uptake, I'm the big guy in the back with a hat on, uh, but that's my wife, Heidi, my eight-year-old son, Isaac, uh, or my nine-year-old son, Isaac, my eight-year-old daughter, Clara, and uh, I'm in what I call a peak dad fashion right there, like a little breathable shirt, some, some uh, hiking pants, probably some new balances, just living my best life right there. Uh, but I'm so excited that uh, I get to be here and that Adam is not here. Uh, I love Adam. I respect Adam. I think he's great. Uh, but it says so much about you guys and this church that you would prioritize his rest, his renewal, and all those great things uh, to get away, to get some time in Israel. It's probably just an incredible experience with Sarah and, and Alaska with the boys. And so I, I'm just excited to be here uh, to kind of fill in and continue this great series that you guys have been uh, started in on uh, called Beneath the Surface. Uh, like I said, I'm the campus pastor at Anderson University, and because it's in my contract, I got to plug AU a little bit, no, uh, but I love AU. I'm an alum. That's where I met my wife. That's where I met Cameron, where I met Mandy, and uh, we love it there. Uh, I had a, a great education, you know, and all that fun stuff, but it was really those relationships and those experiences in ministry on campus that really shaped and formed me. And there's a lot of great schools, there's a lot of great schools, you know, God covers a multitude of sins if you go to Taylor, but <laughs> AU is great, AU is great, there's a lot of great schools, there's a lot of great schools, God's kingdom is big, even for the annoying people, but God's, God's kingdom is big, and uh, I love AU, and if you want to chat a little bit, thanks Cal for letting me bug you, and uh, I'd love to talk to you about AU if you have any questions. But today I get to, get to continue this series called Beneath the Surface. And I love the way uh, Andy started things off and talked about the ways in which the iceberg metaphor is so true in our lives. That there's often so much hidden beneath the surface. Now we often will do this, right? We will, we will kind of put out there on social media only the pictures where we don't have a double chin, right? We, we will put the, only the filtered stuff out there. When we tell stories, we are the heroes of the story, right? We always give ourselves the benefit of the doubt and we judge others on their actions. Uh, we, we are always kind of putting this filtered version of, of, of us that we want to put out there, but that's just the top, the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more below the surface. We can hide that. Uh, well, today I'm talking about this idea, this concept of self-awareness. And what happens in self-awareness, where we kind of struggle, or at least where I struggle, is not only am I lying or hiding things from other people, I will lie and hide things from myself, sometimes even the most obvious things. Well, right after I graduated AU, I started a youth ministry at a church, and I was their youth pastor in central Illinois, this, this rural, great little small town, just an incredible church, incredible experiences there. But one of the things that was really attractive to a newly married, newly graduated 22-year-old without a penny in, a, in the bank was the fact that they had a parsonage for me. They had a house where my wife and I, Heidi, could live. Now, it was right across the street from the church, so Everybody knew where I was at all times, but it, you know, it was really, really nice. And, and I don't know about you, I'm not exactly handy, but I'm very optimistic about what I can do around the house, sometimes to my detriment, right? I, I, am, a, I am what you call a minimum three trip to the hardware store, to Lowe's, the Menards for, for a project, right? Like I'm the one that goes back in, the cashier's like, hey, weren't you just here? I was like, yes, I don't want to talk about it, all right? I, I grabbed the wrong thing, I had to come back. Well, at this parsonage, there was a problem uh, with the garbage disposal. And so today, what I would have done was get on YouTube and you know, find all the troubleshooting videos. We didn't have YouTube back then. It was a long time ago. And so I call my dad, and I, I get some tips, and she's okay, well, we gotta, we got to check some things, right? Let's make sure there's power to it. Let's go to the, go to the fuse box, go to the circuit breaker, make sure things are, are flipped. Are, okay, that's good. Everything's running good there. Okay, it's not power. All right, well, grab an Allen wrench and, and go up underneath the garbage disposal, and you can kind of manually move things and kind of free something up if something's gotten stuck there. Well, that didn't work. So now I'm out of ideas. So I have to give in. I have to call the, the deacon who was over my parsonage. This great retired guy named Terry. He was very handy. He was one of those guys who's retired but never really quit working. Like he's always doing a bunch of stuff, and he's just, you know, he's, he's involved in a lot of different things. 
So we finally call Terry, and he comes over and, uh, one evening, and, and he, you know, he comes in with his tool bag and stuff. And he makes you know, chit-chat. We, we're talking a little bit. And he's like, all right, so what's, what's the problem? He's like, I don't know. The garbage disposal won't work. So let's take a look. So he sets his tool bag there on the counter. He opens up the, the cabinets, pulls stuff out, and he gets up underneath there. And he's quiet for a minute. And then he says, give it a try. So I flip the switch, and the garbage disposal turns on. Well, apparently, there was a plug that come unplugged, and I, in my great wisdom, did not notice that the garbage disposal wasn't even plugged. So Terry, this retired gentleman, has to come over, and I'm like, I'm sorry, man, you just came all this way, and you know, it's evening, it's dinner time, I hope, hope, hope you know, it didn't ruin your evening plans too much, hope dinner's still warm for you, but thanks for plugging in my garbage disposal. Because <laughs> sometimes we can miss what's right in front of us, Right? Sometimes, sometimes the obvious thing is not obvious to us. It, it, we've hidden it. We've pushed it beneath the surface. We've, we've hidden it to a point where we don't even recognize what's going on. And it takes someone from the outside. It takes an event. It takes a, a, a catalyst of sorts to kind of shock us back into the reality of what's going on around us. The reality of the truth. And there was something that I listened to from your identity series earlier this summer that talked about the importance of this, of understanding at the, at the first and foremost thing, we have to understand who we are in Jesus Christ. Pastor Andy said this in, in, in a sermon, and I wrote it down, and maybe he said it, maybe he didn't, maybe he's like me and doesn't have a book, or he should have a book, or whatever, but this is what he said that I, I, I want you to hear again. He says, when I begin to believe the message of the gospel of Jesus... When I learn to see myself and identify myself as God calls me, I am free. The first and the last word on who you are is who God says you are. And we're not talking about freedom here, the freedom that comes from understanding this. It's not about a, a civil liberties kind of thing. This is a freedom about grace and freedom from shame, freedom from, from whatever it is that holds us back. This is the first and last word. We have to have the self-awareness to accept that who we are is not who other people say we are. It's who God says that we are. Now, now there's a lot of good work that we can do with self-awareness, right? Uh, maybe for you, at work or in a class, you've taken some sort of personality test and you found out that you're an extrovert or an introvert or there's a number or there's these words that go with you. You're, I remember one time I took a personality quiz and you could either be a golden, golden retriever or a turtle. And I'm like, why am I a turtle? That just, I just I feel, I gotta go take a diet. Like I gotta you know, do some changes here, right? How many of you know that you're an extrovert, right? The extroverts, they always want to raise their hands. They always want to be. The introverts, if I asked you to raise your hand, you'd all leave. So I'm not going to ask you to do that, right? But th there's some good things about self-discovery. There's some good things about discovering who you are, how you're wired, how you, how you interact in terms of relationships, how you interact professionally. All those things are good. And I, I think there's this big kind of cultural current towards those things. But those things only get us so far. Those things are a poor reflection of the truth of who God says that we are. And so often, our self-awareness can be limited because we don't go first to who God says that we are. This truth is all over the Bible. This truth about who we are, about God calling us into ourselves, calling us saying, you are my beloved, you are my children, you are my masterpiece, you are mine. We see this over and over again where the people of the scriptures in these stories, they get sideways on this. Adam and Eve, after they sin, after they go against what God has that is best for them, after they go against that, they hide in shame and cover themselves in their nakedness. And when God approaches Adam and they have that conversation, what does God ask of him? He says, who told you you were naked? Who told you this lie about yourself? Who told you that you were somehow wrong, worthless, not worthy, that you were somehow missing out on what God 
has for you. Understand that that is the primal question. When Moses is called by God to lead his people out of, out of slavery in Egypt, at the burning bush and throughout, we see over and over and over again where God is calling Moses and Moses is calling the people back to who they really are. The preamble of the Ten Commandments is a reminder that you are my selected, you are my chosen, you are my people with whom I love. And all through the scriptures, we see Jesus doing this, calling people to him him, not for some moral superiority, not for some pathway to better living, not with something like that, but says, this is who you are. You are my children. Come to me, and I call you friends. The Apostle Paul, as he is writing to these churches, these groups of people that have heard what become the gospel messages that we read today, they've heard these stories of Jesus. He gives them guidance. He gives them counsel. Sometimes he has heard they are having issues. Sometimes they write directly to him. And sometimes he kind of just says some general advice for these new churches. And he writes to them and he's over and over and over again calling them back to who they are and who God says that they are. Now, the Apostle Paul, Paul who writes much, much of the New Testament, who writes these letters, writes one letter that's kind of designed to be this circular letter. It wasn't just for one church. It was designed to get passed around. And it was going to an area where he wanted to go but had not been there yet. He, had not, he doesn't know these people. He's writing to the people in the churches, the house churches, the micro churches in Rome. And he writes this long letter this very long letter compared to other, other letters and other correspondence and other writings of the ancient world. He writes this book that we know as Romans. And he is brilliant, and it's sometimes hard for me to get, get my head around what he's talking about. But understand this, there's something powerful what he says. This is what he says in Romans chapter 8, verse 15. Paul writes, So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit, when he adopted you as his own children, now we call him Abba, Father. Now, like I said, Paul can be, can be hard to follow him, hard to figure out what's going on. So I find it helpful that oftentimes Paul will put two things, two concepts in opposition to each other. And here it's very clear. He's talking about the difference between being a fearful slave as compared to being an adopted child. A fearful slave versus an adopted child. Child. Now, when he is using this slave metaphor, he's, he's a metaphor. He's not talking about literal slavery in this instance. What he's talking about is this idea, this concept, this reality that so many of us know all too well of being tied, of being shackled in this cycle of sin and shame. You know this cycle. You might call it something different, but it's this idea where when we take steps that are outside of what God has for us, outside of what God would call his best, well, these are sins. We are missing the mark. We are not living into who God says that we are. And then we tell ourselves, like Adam and Eve, that we're worthless. We tell ourselves that we are no longer worthy of what God has for us. This is who we are. We are the sum of our mistakes. I don't deserve love. I don't deserve a second chance. And so self-destructive behavior just compounds and it spirals and it cycles and it cycles. But what Paul says, you are no longer fearful slaves. You are adopted children. Now, in the Roman world, adoption was a concept that was nuanced. There was very multiple different ways that adoption could be played out. It could be kind of a professional thing. It'd almost be like hiring somebody in. And they, they're, they're kind of part of the household. They're, they're kind of in. And they work for the, for, the, for the household and the master and the owner and all those things but they're not kids. You can have somebody who you adopt, it's almost like a patron. Like I'm adopt, I'm sponsoring, I'm gonna get this kid educated, this person educated, I'm gonna bring them up. They're gonna be familial, but they're not my kids. But then full adoption, the, the word that, that Paul uses here, the adopted children, is you are now part of the family. You are on equal terms with biological children. You have all the rights, all the privileges that come with that. See, that's what Paul is contrasting. The, the sin and shame cycle, the fear cycle, the slavery that is that, with the grace and the forgiveness and the adoption to full co-heirs with Christ, this is what Paul is talking about here. See, that shame cycle, it doesn't have to be those overt things, right? It doesn't have to be the obvious stuff. It doesn't have to be infidelity. It doesn't have to be lying or greed. 
It doesn't have to be wanton destruction of life. It doesn't have to be whatever this overt, obvious thing is. But it could be something that's just as insidious. I think a lot of times it's about unmet expectations. About 10 years ago, I was a youth pastor here in Hamilton County at a great church. But I didn't want to be a youth pastor anymore. You ever been in a job, you don't want that job anymore? You feel like you're kind of stuck. I was in that job, and it was a good job. It was a great church, great people, but I just, this is not where I wanted to be. And so I was about to turn 30, and so I created a list. I created a list of goals, and I titled it because I'm an arrogant, you know what, 30 things to accomplish by the time I'm 30, because after you're 30, you know, it's over, right? It's done. It's done. Like, now I'm saying the same thing about 40, but you know, here, it's coming. It's coming quick. 30 things I want to do by the time I'm 30. And I didn't write it because I was arrogant in pencil. I didn't write it in pen. I wrote it in Sharpie. You know the smell of a Sharpie? Like, there's no other smell like that. And to me, that, that, that screams arrogance and permanence and boldness. But one of those goals on that list was that I was going to be a lead pastor by the time I was 30. I was going to be a youth pastor more. I was going to be teaching and leading and doing all that stuff. And I was on this track of this church. It was, a, it was a track where I was kind of kind of be sent out. And I was going to lead something new. I was so excited about this. I, put, I was so, so excited about this. I felt like I was stuck, and this was my way out of this being stuck professionally. Except there started to be rumblings. I'd meet with these, these leaders that I still submit to and still love and still respect. And they say, well, Josh... We're having conversations. We're just not sure if it's, you're the right person for this right time and this right situation. We love you. We believe in you. Yes, but, but for this one, we're not so sure. And I kind of done that self-denial thing. I kind of just pushed it beneath the surface. I'm just going to ignore that because it's all going to work out because this was written in Sharpie. And then it was one of those summer nights. I, I grew up in Indiana and like daylight savings time still screws with me. Anybody like that? And you're like, it should, I should be going to bed. I, why am I still outside doing yard work at 9.30 just because it's daylight out? That's me. Maybe it's not you. But I'm in those spots. And it's before we had kids, so we got too much time on our hands. And we're in one of those starter homes with like 100 square feet of like kind of grass, but mainly weeds and rocks, right? And, and we're in that, in that spot of life. And we're so excited about what's next. And I'm just thinking about what's next. Because I'm realizing it's all falling apart. And I get a call from my pastor. He says, hey, we just met. Our elder team just met. We love you. We believe in you. But you're, you're a no for right now. You're not going to move on to this next thing. And I did that thing where you get crushing news, but you don't want the person on the other end of the line to know it's crushing news. Oh, yeah, I understand. Sure, that's fine. I hang up. And I start sweating, which is not an abnormal thing for me. But I start sweating a lot. And the room starts spinning, which is new for me as well. And I go to the kitchen, and I put my hands on that counter that was trying really hard to be, look like it was granite. No one, no one was getting fooled by that. And the room's spinning, and I'm sweating, and, and my, my vision starts to narrow. I got black at the edges of my vision. And, and I feel this pressure on my chest. My breath is getting shorter and shallower. And I'm like, well, you know, you step on a scale lately, like you're having a heart attack. Like, get it together. But it wasn't a heart attack. As I stand there and I sit there and it's like, okay, my heart's racing, but I'm okay. It's okay. But the room is spinning and I think, okay, I know what I need. I need, I need a glass of water because that'll solve everything, right? So I get a glass of water and that doesn't really help. It wasn't until after the fact, after I started talking to some professionals, I realized I was having a panic attack. And for the last 10 years or so, through talking to professionals, which I highly recommend, through taking medication that those professionals prescribe, which, of course, take what the pros tell you to do, what the pros tell you to do, right? And through community and prayer and church and family and honesty and good relationships and all those things, my anxiety, I'm living with it, right? It's still there, but it's not who I am. But it was interesting in those moments where I, I, I'm freaking out because my plans aren't going like I thought. 
But that was my physical reaction. It was that shame cycle. Josh, you're stuck. You're never going to amount to anything. You blew it. Of course. The end of the story, showing God's irony and sense of humor, which I don't always appreciate, is that by the time I was 30, I was a lead pastor. We went and planted a church in the Cincinnati area, and, and that was an incredible you know, eight years of our lives. But when we moved there, I was officially the pastor of this church. I was getting paid by this church, except the church didn't really exist. <laughs> it was me, it was my wife, and our infant son, and I was their lead pastor. <laughs> I did not appreciate God's sense of humor on that one. But this is how it works. We start believing these lies. We start writing down goals in Sharpie. And when things don't go our way, when life kicks us in the teeth, whether it's something obvious and far more profound than just not getting a promotion I thought I was up for and not getting an opportunity I thought I was, I was due, when life happens and, and everything starts to fall apart, what do you do? There's a passage of scripture that was really, really helpful for me. And maybe you're in one of those spots like I just described. You feel like you're about to be found out. There's all this anxiety and worry. I would encourage you to spend some time with these two verses from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. They're powerful to me. Maybe they'll be powerful to you. Peter says, humble yourselves. Again, I was arrogant, prideful. I needed to hear that. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time, not to my time, not on my schedule, but in God's timing. And then hear this, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. About three years ago, I got to spend two weeks in Israel and I just have to warn you guys, when Adam is back, he's gonna talk about his trip a lot, okay? Just, just go with it, just, just listen. It's not, it's not just showing vacation pictures. It's very important, it's a life-changing experience. If you have an opportunity to go to Israel, go to Israel, all right? But it's still like a trip, and there's these like little, like I don't know, touristy things that happen. And so we're out on the, 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 the Sea of Galilee, which is more like a lake. Adam will tell you about it. Don't worry, you'll hear more about it from him. It, it's more like a lake, or, or Sarah can. And, and you're out there on a boat, and there's these guides, right? And, you know, you're trying to get the authentic, you know, Galilean experience, right? So let's cast a net. This is where the, the fishermen, many of the disciples were fishermen. They lived in this area. Let's cast a net. And they have this net that you know, I'm sure is really authentic, right? But they have this net, and it's not, you know, fishing like this. And so you have, to, you have to hold it in a certain way. And it's heavy and it's big. And then you have to throw it in a way that it'll fan out on the water surface as it goes down to collect whatever fish are there. It's a skill. It's an active thing. Peter, a fisherman, uses this active word, cast, to cast your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Don't not just allow Jesus in, not just... Let Jesus kind of sidle up next to you. No, 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 to cast your anxieties on him. When was the last time you told Jesus about your deepest fears, your deepest anxieties? So what does that look like? Maybe for you, you need, you need a, a, a kind of a real tangible next step. Well, how do I do that? How do, how do I do that, man? I, you're saying all that, I agree with that, but how do I do that? Something that Christians have done for 2,000 years, and Jews did this before them and do it today, is they pray the Psalms. They pray something that was already written. And could I suggest, if you're looking for something to pray, and something to, to really sit with, maybe it's Psalm 139. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24 says this. Investigate my life, O God. Find out everything about me. Cross-examine and test me. Get a clear picture of what I'm about. See for yourself whether I've done anything wrong then guide me on the road to eternal life. See, moving from being a fearful slave to being an adopted child means that we have to become self-aware. We have to allow God in. We have to listen to what God has to say about us as opposed to what other people are saying about us. And we also have to recognize that this is not a one-time thing. This is a continual thing. See, grace is free. You can be forgiven by Jesus Boom, it's done. It doesn't cost you anything. Yes and amen. Following Jesus, man, that's a lifelong pursuit. Jesus says that, that follow him, that his, 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 his burden is light. His path is easy. Yes, but it's also hard. 
following Jesus still is something that doesn't just happen on its own. It doesn't just happen on its own. We have to understand this, that we have to have these frequent checkups because just as the main idea, one of the big themes of the Bible is that God is calling his people back to him, that God's love story with you and I, and this is an ongoing thing. Conversely, the great sin of the Bible is not the things that we would think of, the, the visible sins. It's something a little deeper. It's something a little bit more all-encompassing. It's idolatry. It's whenever we take something that's good, or take anything, but usually it's something that's good, and we try to put it in the place of the ultimate. We take something that we try to put in the place that's only reserved for God in our lives, and usually it's something good, and it gets twisted around. Maybe it's family and relationships. Maybe the the genuine love that you have for your family, which is pure and good, has crept into a place that only God should be. Maybe for you, it's providing for your family. I know a lot of guys, I know I struggle with this. I want to provide for them. I want to, I want to give them good gifts. I want to be able to have them, have them you know, pay for their college and, and live a life of comfort. I don't want them to, to, to be in need. I want to provide. That's a good thing. That's a good urge until it becomes something that's not, until it steps into the place where only God can be. It's so easy for us, whether, whether it's, it's, it's something like providing turning into greed, whether it's, whether it's our, our relationships turning into something that's codependent, whatever it is where it becomes something that's not good. And idols pop up and they grow in our lives all the time. And so we have to be self-aware. We have to pay attention to these things, namely our fears and our anxieties, because this is the truth I've seen in my life, I see in scripture. It's this, our fears and anxieties tend to reveal idols. Our fears and our anxieties tend to reveal idols. What was I fearful about? I was fearful about, about failing in my job, and my career path, and my goals. And so my fear and my anxiety clamped onto that, and I had a physical reaction to it. What, what are the fears and anxieties that you have? Perhaps those things have become an idol. Perhaps you're always fearful of what might happen to a loved one. Perhaps you're always fearful of, of a loved one getting that diagnosis, of, of having an accident. Uh, perhaps you're fearful of losing your job. Perhaps you're in a spot where you're where always kind of concerned, am I doing enough? Uh, maybe for you, it's the what ifs. You play the what if game all the time. Well, what if this happens and this happens? And what if they make that decision and they do this and they do that? And what if this happens to me? And what, what if I experience this? And maybe it's things that are just so far beyond your control. You have, you have no real control over these things, yet they dominate your mind and your thinking. I think we can go around the room. We can talk about the idols in our lives. We, we can name a lot of them. But I think there's one that's, that's almost like acceptable, but I think very dangerous. I think that for many American Christians, politics has become an idol. Take something good, politics. Figuring out policies, how to govern, how to live as a society. That's a good conversation. We, we should be engaged in that. We should be prayerful about that. We should educate and work towards those things. Yes and amen. I'm not saying it's bad, but perhaps it's become an idol. Andy Stanley wrote a book recently, and it just recently came out, called Not In It to Win It. I recommend this book to you. In, in this book, he talks about the relationship that Jesus followers seem to have with politics in America. And he asked one of these questions that, that just kind of shook me. It shook me because I got my opinions about politics. I got my opinions about who I vote for. I love to vote. Like, like I go into a ballot box, I'll vote for dog catcher and not have a clue. I just want to exercise my right to vote. I love that. I, I love that. I, I stay up and watch election t- re- re- returns and results like a madman, right? Like that's who I am. I love this stuff. But perhaps it's become a bit of an idol, And he asked this question that I think is indicative of the kinds of questions that we should be asking ourselves to figure out if our anxieties and our fears are really rooted in an idol. It's a question that shakes, and it's a question that might make you a little uncomfortable because it made me uncomfortable as I was listening to it. I was listening to the audiobook, and I was walking, I was in the woods taking a hike, I was listening to this book, and it literally stopped me because I I think it poked at something that I wasn't ready to be poked at. He said this, he says, would you rather... I said, would it bother you more? What would bother you more if one, your child grew up, your adult child started voting 
started aligning with a political party that was different than yours? Would that bother you more? If your adult child just, just went the opposite direction of you politically, would that bother you more or would it bother you more if your adult child stopped going to church? It was one of those questions I was like, oh, I don't like that question. Maybe I got some, maybe I got some idols in my life. Maybe I got some things that I have taken that are good things and made them far more important than they really should be. Maybe it's not politics for you. Maybe it's greed. Maybe it's relationships. Maybe it's your profession, your career. I don't know, whatever it is. We, 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 we tend to turn anything into an idol because God created us to worship. But if we're gonna move from being a fearful slave to being an adopted child, I think we have to understand something. That grace is free and that following Jesus can be hard and it's definitely a lifelong pursuit. This pursuit we call discipleship, it's called sanctification. The Bible talks about this as suffering or long suffering. In Romans chapter five, Paul says this. He says that not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame. When we miss when we miss the truth of that we are who God says that we are, when we start believing the lies, we find ourselves in a fearful place, a place of shame where we are told that we are not worthy, we are not good enough, that we are not whatever enough, that we are a failure. And the God of the universe gives us a hope. And that hope is wrapped up in this, that in the backwater of a conquered land, there was a teenage girl who was engaged to get married. And she turned up pregnant and everyone in town started talking. And everyone in town went, was starting to talk and the friends of Joseph went to him and said, hey, just walk away from this. You don't want to mess with this. Dishonor will be heaped upon you. Yet this young couple, the young girl, and the, the older man who were about to be married, this couple says, no, we're going to go through this. We're going to have this baby. And so born into all sorts of fear and uncertainty and all this, this noise about people saying, this is who you really are, they bring this child into the world. From the get-go, there's all sorts of rumor. There's all sorts of accusation about Jesus. And he grows up. He does things that a kid does to annoy his parents. He doesn't stay with them when they're in the big city. Kind of runs off. He tends to kind of fly off at the mouth. He says it's right, but it's really annoying, right? Don't you love that, parents, when your kids say something that's true, but you just don't want to hear it? Imagine if it was Jesus. <laughs> and he grows up, and he gets into work. He did a profession, a career. He, he's doing what his dad did. He was a carpenter or a laborer or a mason or something. He worked with his hands. And yet he tends to have this following and he goes after the people who are uneducated, the people who have had, had you know, the whole world say all sorts of things about them, give them labels and identities that aren't true. And he goes to those folks and he invites them in. And he starts teaching them. And he has this authority and this power and this insight. And he challenges the people that says, no, you can't do that. And he challenges them with truth and love and healing and miracles. And there's this whole thing building here, building here. And it, it, it gets this noise and all of a sudden he becomes a threat. And all the people who have said all these things about Jesus, about who he is, these lies, well, they're not working. And it becomes such a threat that there's this conspiracy to get this guy out of the picture. So knowingly, willingly, this Jesus goes and not just loses his life. Not just is put on a cross, the instrument of death that is unimaginable for us. The Romans were very good at this. They had this down to a science of how to increase pain and prolong life until ultimately you died in a very public way. He was shamed, he was tortured, he was humiliated, and he was put on a cross, and a Friday after Passover, he dies. That by itself is a good story. The ultimate, the great story is the fact that it's come Sunday, he's alive. 
Come Sunday, he walks out of this tomb alive and declares some things. He declares that this is just a preview. This is what you can expect when I am making all things new. When my father comes down and sets up residence with you forever, this is the life, the kingdom life that I've been talking about. This is right here for you. This is the hope, and this hope does not bring you shame. There's a lot beneath the surface. There's a lot beneath the surface in our lives. There are things that we hide from others and there are things that we hide from ourselves. May you be the type of person who starts with the truth of not what other people say about you, but but what God says about you. That you're beloved, that you're a masterpiece, that you are a son, that you are a daughter, that you are adopted into the family, that you are co-heirs with Christ, that you are a friend of God. May you start with that. May you have the courage to ask the hard questions about the idols in your lives. May you have the courage to go to those who love you, who know you, and have them speak truth into your life. May you be the type of person that understands that grace is free and that following Jesus is a lifelong journey that is beautiful yet hard. May you be the type of person, and may this place and this group of people be the type of church that moves forward with hope and not shame, that moves forward not as fearful slaves, but as adopted children. May you and may we be the people of the king. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this church, for what they're about, for what they're doing, for the ways in which they have submitted to you, for the ways in which they are doing the work that you've called them to. I thank you for their leaders, their pastors, their people who serve in so many different ways. But Father, for all of us, for myself first and for the rest of us as well, may we be a people that understand that we have to first listen to who you say that we are, that we start there, that we cast our anxieties onto you because you care for us, because you can take it, and that we can embrace the hope that your life your death, your resurrection brings to us. Thank you, Father. Amen.